second issue is soil improvement. The concepts of soil improvement are well established. What is the main idea of doing soil improvement? Should be good compaction, less drainage, more cementation and so on. Where do you use them? For creating pathways, roads, huts and homes and sometimes other structures also which are of strategic importance. So, what is the challenge in soil improvement? To avoid okay. Okay, that's right. More strength. Anything else? Yes, you are creating an imp impermeable system. So, if you create an impermeable system, what happens to the pore water pressures? Increases. So, the biggest challenge with ground improvement techniques is believe me, people do not bother about this issue, but the whole challenge is when you are creating a system by improving the soil which is going to be less pervious, impervious, what about the power of pressures? So, this is where you have to have a different model which has to be applied for soil improvement schemes. Do you agree with this? That is it. You do not agree? It is a challenge. So, any idea how would you reduce pore water pressures from the soils which have been modified or improved? Did you, ever, did, did you ever wonder that why preloading is done by putting the band drains inside? What preloading is doing without putting band drains? Exactly. So, the, the answer is you always do preloading by installing PVC band drains or sand drains. Clear? Simply preloading the structure will not improve the strength. It will keep on building up pore pressures. So, one way is to remove pore pressures which are developing because of preloading would be to insert PVDs. So, you have pore pressure release and settlement and system becomes stabilized, okay. It is logical. So, what are the basic objectives of soil improvement? Daniel, you are talking about durability. So, we have discussed what are, what, are, what is meant by durability, what are the attributes of durability? When you say some system is very durable, rock is more durable than concrete or concrete is more durable than rock? Sorry? Then why did you discover concrete? It should have been a, <laughs> you, you are still living in stone age. <laughs> you should have been happy with stones, is it not? Why you discovered rock? Oh, sorry, uh, concrete. Huh? Workable. Yes, you have to say something. My question is simple. Sorry? My question is very simple. Which one is more durable, rock or concrete? You are saying rock. Anybody for concrete in the class? No one. Then write off the concrete technology. <laughs> the first parameter is strength when you talk about durability. Rocks may not be so durable, why? Because they may not show you so much required strength. So, when you say concrete of certain strength, you are sure that this system is going to give you at least 95 percent of the designated strength, clear? So, durability the first parameter is strength. There should be a target strength, FCK versus crushing strength. 
all right characteristic strength and crushing strength volume the volume of the system should remain as it is it should not change no disintegration is allowed rocks would disintegrate or not there are some rocks which may disintegrate how about the concrete yes or no <laughs> they are all living in stone age <laughs> if if concrete is going to disintegrate then why you are designing it of course the idea is that you are designing a system which is durable which is not going to disintegrate the volume is remains is going to remain constant all right so this is how you define the durability so in my opinion concrete is more durable than rock and that is why mankind has invented concrete and they are not depending upon rock much drainage all right drainage should be less or more for making a system durable less there could be rocks which are highly fissured fractured disintegrated and hence the hydraulic conductivity or drainage would be maximum so a durable system should not allow transport of any flux through it agreed that means water should also not flow through this so drainage should be as less as possible if you are designing a durable system erosion how most of the soils are formed erosion of rocks okay so these are the attributes of you know durability unfortunately only structures guys they talk about durability of concrete we do not talk about stability of soils and we do not talk about durability of soils also but those who are involved with soil improvement work they should have these four parameters in their mind what is the meaning of this the whole idea of improving the soil is it should be more strengthful the volume should remain constant clear the drainage should be less and erosion should be extremely less so these are the aims of or the objectives of adopting any soil improvement program so we are trying to convert soil in a sort of a very durable structure or a system which is less susceptible to environmental changes or effects i am sure you are aware of the techniques which are normally adopt for soil improvement okay historically people designed igloos what are igloos ice clear yeah? so in south pole north pole people will definitely make igloos bricks is the simplest possible example of soil improvement you take the soil mass shape it up bake it add some chemicals bake it so what has happened the soil has become more stabilized volume remains constant drainage is reduced more strength clear and less erosion so all those four parameters are inbuilt in the system mortars when you make mortars pathways different type of structure so these are all historic treatment or schemes which people have followed what is happening in the present day world you compact the soil to attain all those four parameters more strength less drainage less change in volume and what was the last one less erosion by the flotation then drainage schemes flooding with water all right electro osmosis apply some current and what happens water simply goes out of the system drainage gets enhanced water goes out the resulting mass is of control volume and gives you more strength ground freezing have you heard of this type of technique ground modification and freezing where do you use it mostly in tunneling operations they go for freezing that too in cold climates you know where you have fractured rock mass and there is no way to do tunneling because of too much of drainage from the rocks so that is where you can go for some local anesthesia sort of a thing you can inject some anesthesia 
and what it does? It makes your hand or that part of the body numb and then you can adopt surgery. The same thing you can do in stretchers. So, you inject freon gas or circulating brine solution and what it does? It lowers down the temperature, freezes the soil mass. So, all the water which is remaining in the pores gets frozen, clear? So, suppose if you are working in a sea phi soil or a sandy soil which is saturated and if I freeze that soil, what will happen? The properties get transformed from friction to cohesion. Is this okay or not? The frozen system will act like a cohesive material rather than a friction material. Is this concept clear or not? So, you have transformed the properties from friction material to a pure cohesive material which is nothing but ice. So, this type of transformation lot of people have tried heating. Earlier days or sometimes in military operations they can create air strips just by heating the top 2 feet or 3 feet of the ground mass. So, what happens? It becomes desiccated. Nature also does the same thing for you. In coastal regions, the water table fluctuates, soil mass becomes wet and then again during the dry period, what happens to this water? It evaporates. When this water evaporates, ultimately what you notice is desiccation cracks on the soil mass. So, this heating is nothing but it is a natural heating or a, a synthetic heating also can be created to remove water from the soils and to make it very strong. So, temporary air strips can be created out of simple heating of the layers of soils. And of course, you can add chemicals which we have discussed earlier as well. Terracotta is nothing but an example of heating of the soil, terracotta. So, you take clay and bake it at elevated temperature. So, ultimately what happens? What type of transformation is this? It is a permanent transformation of minerals or temporary? If temperatures are very high, I can amalgamate the minerals. So, whenever the amalgamation comes in picture, this becomes your igneous type of material. So, the nature has created temperatures of few hundred degrees centigrade, which you can create very easily in the laboratory. Clear? So, you can convert this clay mass into a sort of a magma and then let it freeze. The same thing you do for creating tiles, refractory systems and so on. This would be anti-heat, anti-chemicals and whatever, anti-magnetic, anti-electricity and all. So, ultimately it boils down to too much of materials modeling. You must be observing this, we are altering the state of the material. It is a physical effect, vibrofloidation is also a physical effect, drainage is also a physical effect. What is electro osmosis? It is a electrophysical effect. So, water contained in the pore is being taken out by applying some electrical current. Now, this type of analysis or studies when people are doing, they have to talk about electrical properties of the soil that how easily the current can be passed through the soil systems and all. Earlier geophysicists used to do this type of studies, but nowadays a lot of geotechnical engineers are also adopting this. One of the industrial waste which everybody is talking about these days is fly ash. So, I do not use the word waste, I say that this is a man made resource, it is a man made soil. So, truly speaking the way we have soil mechanics, a day should come where you should talk about fly ash mechanics. It is a natural resource which is man made and the more and more industrial activity which a country takes, you are producing more and more ash. However, the challenges are how to transport this material from one location to another location and so on. Why transportation is so difficult? So, that means handling and storage is also a big problem. So, because of the physical attributes, the material is very light, lighter than air, it flies off, causes a lot of environmental problems. And then the question is how to utilize this material. So, days are gone when people used to talk about 
apply ash utilization only for making bricks. Nowadays the focus is not on making bricks only. That was about 20 years back when I was a student or 15 years back. What should be the focus in today's scenario where people should like to use apply ash? That is right. I will show you some of the recent developments by using fly ash and what researchers have tried to work on. This is the way you can transport the ash. Do you find any difference between the two modes of transportation? Why it is being done open and closed? Or what is the intention? Why you should adopt this type of disposal system or transportation system? Why you should adopt this type of a transportation system? If you want to protect the pozzolanicity of the material, you do not want to allow this material to interact with water, rain, you have to cut it off from the environment so that the calcium which is present in the system should not interact with water. So, this type of a unit is in high demand by which type of industries? Those who are producing cement, clear? So, this is a clear cut demarcation, the type of ash which you produce, how would you transport it and where its utility would be. However, when you talk about the second situation, where you are going to use this type of ash? See, if the direction of movement of the train is this, you reverse the direction, in which direction what commodity will be coming like this? The coal is coming from the mines in this direction to an industrial unit and if train is moving away from it, this fly ash is going for filling purpose of the mines. So, this is a very good deal with most of the coal manufacturer, government of India has done. They will buy the coal from a manufacturer only when he is ready to use the fly ash for filling purpose. Clear? Otherwise, what is going to happen? This type of material keeps on stacking near the power plants. So, ideally, when you go for open disposal system or transportation system, this material is not good for pozzolanic activity. This will work as a good fill material, filling of mines, filling of ditches, and so on. This is for making the embankments as a backfill material. You can compact it along with the soil and what is the beauty of fly ash? Why it should be classified as a good backfill material? That is right. So, special gravity is very less. That means, the earth pressures which this system will induce on the walls are going to be quite less. Unfortunately, fly ash cannot be compacted. It is very difficult to compact the grains of the fly ash. You have to go into the microscopy and you, you will see that these grains are perfect spheres most of the time. So, achieving a density out of it is very difficult. I will show you some of the micrographs. But as a thumb rule, compacting fly ash is very tough. Okay. These are the examples from road construction. I am sure you must have heard of road construction using fly ash, either by direct disposal on the ground, compacting it, putting some water and doing some pneumatic rolling, all right. These are all old techniques. You can use this material for structural and mine fills. So, these are the open cast mines which are being filled with the help of the fly ash. This is the open cast mine where you are filling the open cast mine with the fly ash. In Canada, there is a fly ash park. Now, following this, what they have done? The entire dump has been converted into a park for amusement. So, the name itself is Fly Ash Park. Following this, we have something like this in Ahmedabad, where the landfills have been used for, they have been converted in public uh, recreation centers. Okay. So, you can use this land in terms of uh, you know, recreation of people.
in situ soil improvement for which you can use lye slurry mixed with cement and lime and then you can inject it in the ground. So, this forms a good gel and ultimately you can improve the soil. We are talking about contaminant uh, migration also. So, you can control contaminant migration by injecting fly ash lime slurry and making piles into the system or the curtain walls or the grouts. So, these are known as thin wall slurry curtain of for waste isolation. So, dig out a certain portion of the ground and then inject in that slurry of fly ash lime and cement. So, ultimately what you are doing you are cutting off the contaminated ground from the environment. I hope you understand what are the limitations of this method. Quality control is definitely very poor. Injecting this slurry would be very tough in the ground. If soil is a clay, it will not percolate into so easily. If it happens to be a fracture drop mass, controlling grout will be very difficult. You keep on pumping the grout and you never know where the grout is going. So, these are the difficulties associated with in situ uh, ground modification or improvement. So, this is what I wanted to show you how you can achieve some value added products from the fly ash. This work was done by my second PhD scholar Dr. Prabir Kole. So, what we did is we converted this ash by giving some hydrothermal treatment and we converted this into a material which is known as a zeolite. So, I was telling you the other day that this type of a system has a tendency to absorb more and more water. Now, this is a very interesting process which keeps on going in nature also. Most of the rocks get zeolitized because of hydroxides which are present in the system like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. So, they leach out of the material and Okay. Hello. So, this system shows a mineralogical alteration. It is a good example of how mineralogical alterations can be simulated in the laboratory or whatever happens in the lab. If you remember sometimes during first or second lecture I was talking about physical alteration, chemical alteration and physico chemical alteration and physico chemical mineralogical alteration. So, this type of simulation we did in the laboratory and what we noticed is that this system shows very high cation exchange capacity. So, a material which shows very high cation exchange capacity is chemically very active or mineralogically very active. So, most of the detergents they show you a very high CEC value, the minerals which are used in that and a high surface area. So, the surface area of this system is much more than the original ash. Incidentally, this also gives an idea to work on activated minerals. This is a one of my students Mr. Jha is working. So, formation of activated minerals and this is also known as silica reduction technology. So, the best possible scenario would be if you can convert all the silica of the soil. So, what happens if you talk about three phase system of silica, alumina and iron. So, if you reduce silica then iron and alumina will be maximum. So, this is the philosophy on which this type of studies have been taken up which is known as SRT. 
so under certain critical conditions you know climatic conditions nature does this so when nature forms original ash into zeolites the silica which is passive is getting converted into a mineral which is highly active another interesting application is uh, extraction of tungsten or the minerals which are of high value where tungsten is used lamp filament that's right so these are the filaments and right now india is importing tungsten you know so if we develop a technology by which we can extract tungsten out of fly ash will be self dependent requires a lot of research just to show you few micrographs of uh, scanning electron microscopes now this is ash particle on which the minerals are being grown it's like cabbage so you grow minerals slowly and slowly the stage comes where <coughs> the minerals or the protrusions on the surface become quite large this is what i have been showing you the other day when you came to the lab of different colors <coughs> so what we are doing is we are altering this material into this state we are seeding process now this system is a zeolite and a much more augmented form of zeolite is this so it depends upon the time of treatment which you have set in for a material the type of chemicals which you are using and the type of environmental condition which you are using a simple technology would be on which uh, i think jai is working you take fly ash and boil it in pressure cooker take a pressure cooker and just boil it the way you cook your vegetables so what we notice is that this creates very good minerals and the same thing is happening in nature how diamond is formed it's a mineralogical alteration at very high temperature and pressure so same thing we are simulating in lab clear and the grades of zeolites which we get out of this activity have to be analyzed so we want to produce min minerals or the zeolites which are highly active and which can be replaced by other commercially available zeolites which are very expensive so this just could give you an idea about how physico chemico mineralogical alterations can be done in the laboratory now where these type of situations become important in our profession any loud thinking if you are designing a foundation on let's say a rock mass so no theory takes care of these alterations which may go on in nature slowly and slowly in 20 years time 50 years time and so on is it not so you just compute bearing capacity based on terzaghi's equation or whatever mayer of equation but nowhere in these equations they take into account the effect of environmental effects which are altering the material clear so this component should get added that how much material deterioration is going to take place when a system is exposed to nature a good example of this was when we were doing bandavali sea link most of the samples and analysis we have done in our laboratory we found that if you just go by the classical geomechanics and the type of bearing capacity you will compute it will be highly misleading why you are taking out samples which are from the sea and which have already gone a major mineralogical alteration in the form of zeolites so you are just <coughs> dealing with them as a spt value which is not correct truly speaking they are zeolites which have already change altered minerals and they will never show you the same bearing capacity after few years so this is where we coined this concept of mineralogical alteration of the material and particularly how to map this information in your bearing capacity theory this is one loud thinking which i am you know doing in front of you so some of you should work in this direction whenever you get a time i hope you will agree conceptually this is correct 